Okay? Good. Uh, and the volume is... Yeah, it's recording. This isn't like here. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for interviewing me. This is exciting to be a part of this. This is a rarity for me. Well, um, so what we do typically is we, we do, we do uh, an introduction, and then I'll kind of outline some, some kind of nuts and bolts. Okay. And then we'll start asking you questions based on, um, on the form that you filled out. Yeah. So, um, I hope you don't make this 90 minutes though. No, it's up to you. You know, it's, yeah. it, whatever you're comfortable because, with. Well, no, I just I have to get home and send, put papers in the, in the post office by tonight. Okay. For my taxes, and I didn't, I didn't know about the taxes. Oh, really? Right. Oh, the yeah, okay, yeah. that's fine. And so, um, is there a preferred time for when you'd like to, to leave the library? Because I've got a clock here. Oh, I don't, I don't mind. Give, give it an hour. Okay, thank that's, you. That's okay. okay. So, um, so, I'll go ahead and start. Um, sure. Uh, so, this interview is, is being conducted on September 14th, 2016, at the Niles Public Library. Okay. My name is Victoria Marty. I am speaking with David Bud Besser. Right. Um, Mr. Besser was born on uh, January 30th, 1925, right. um, in Chicago. In Chicago. Um, and uh, you now live in, in Glenview, right. Illinois. And uh, Mr. Besser learned of the Veterans History Project through, um, was it through Neil, or how did you hear about the, the program? Through Neil. Through Neil, okay. I, I never even knew about it. Oh, you didn't? Okay. No. Um, and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project, and uh, okay. here is his story. Okay. Um, okay, so Mr. Buster, how would you prefer to be addressed during this interview? Anything we want, but hey you. Okay, <laughs> 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 okay. So, uh, okay. So, um, start with the questions here. Uh, when did you enter the service? Uh, in May, May 20th, 1943. Okay, and um, now where were you living at the time? In, in 67th Street. 67th Street. Yeah. Okay. So, and what was that? It was the corner you said at 67th and Chappelle, actually. Chappelle. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's in, in High Park. No, that, that's in South Shore, the beginning of South Shore, I think. Okay. And. Uh, how did you happen to How did you happen to go to University of Chicago? Oh. Uh, High school. Do you have something in the family? That's well, my family? actually, my grandmother went to U C. Yeah, no, she did their. Um, uh, uh, wow. Yeah, she didn't graduate. She ended up. Um, oh, from the university. Right? Yeah, she from the oh. She she went to another another. Um, she transferred. Wow, um, that's but, terrific. Yeah, she's from she's from the city, and so she's passed on now. Ah, okay. so you're the third generation of your family to went to college. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which is uh, unusual for us. It's not only unusual; it's almost in very few people I know. Their parents ever went to college? Yeah, it was unique, and so yeah. you know, especially at that time. Oh yeah. Where we go, but uh, it was definitely a valuable experience for her. So. Oh sure. Um, okay, so you were living in 67th and Chappelle, mm -hmm. um, and uh, 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 what were you doing before? Were you in, in high school? I had graduated high school. Okay. I graduated in February and I went to Army in May. Okay, and which High Park? You said High Park High School? Was yeah. It? Right. And uh, now, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. You drafted. Okay. Yeah. Um, I okay. went to a different college for about 10, 10 weeks during that period. I don't know if it's significant or not. Sure. Yeah. There was one called Wilson on the south side. And um, I was going to the service in May, and I graduated in February. Okay. But I didn't want to stay home, so I went to both junior college for about three months. So, wait, when did you graduate high school then? Well, uh, February 43. Okay, February 43, and mm -hmm. then you went to junior college? Just May, May, uh, May 1st. Okay, May 1st of 43? Right. Okay, and then uh, what was the name, of the, do you remember the name of the, the junior college? Uh, Wilson. Okay, it was the Wilson, Wilson yeah. Junior College? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was in, that was in South Shore? No, that was in Englewood. Oh, in Englewood, okay. Yeah. Okay, and how long were you there at, at Wilson? Just for about three months. Okay, three months. And then you were drafted? Right. Okay. And in, um, did you go into the army? Yes. Okay. And um, did you pick the the service branch that you joined? No, I was drafted, and uh, they wanted me to go in the navy. The day I was drafted, I think they had an eighty percent draft for people in the navy, and I have a problem. I, I didn't know how to swim, oh. so I, I told them I said no way. 
So that's how it went in the Army. Okay. Um, now, where were you in inducted? Um, a fish, well, in, in Chicago, really, but uh, Camp Grant was the first place we went to. Camp Grant. Now, where is, is where was that? It's, it's, it's a northern suburb around North Chicago. It was close to it. Okay. And how long, how long did you spend there? Oh, just a few days. Just a few days, okay. Mm -hmm. Where, um, what were your first days there, or just your few days there? Like, what yeah, was, what was it? Nothing significant. I don't even remember. Okay. What happened after that? Where did you go after after? Then from there, I went to uh, Pennsylvania. Okay. It was about 40 miles from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And the name of the camp was, um, I, I don't recall. That's okay. We can, you know, if you think about it later, so it's... Okay. And what, how long did you spend there? Do you remember? Um, about 13 weeks. 13 weeks, okay. And then, and then I enlisted in the, in the Air Corps. Okay. And I was in the Air Cadet Program. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. What's, okay. So 13 weeks um, at Pennsylvania, what, what was that like? It was just basic training. Okay. And uh, it was really a pretty good program. Um, and the old people in the outfit were about 24 years old that were running it, the officers. Okay. And those days, I was 18, and most of us were 18, you know. And the 25 year olds, 24 year olds were running it, and they were quite well disciplined, and they were very good military people. Good. Did you, did you know, did you go to Pennsylvania? Did you know other people when you went no. uh, into the area? Okay. No. I met two or three at Camp Grant that I went, went to Pennsylvania with. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, then they enlisted in the Air Corps mm -hmm. um, to become an Air Cadet. And then, uh, so how long was that? That was for, um, let's see, it was about nine or ten months. Oh, okay. Because it was near the end of the war, they eliminated just about all of us. <clears throat> I think there was about 120 in our outfit, and 105 of us went back to the service we were in. Because it was near the end of the war, we only had a year to go, and they probably figured they didn't need any more pilots, or you know, they had enough. So, and so were you one? Of, you were one of the hundred and five that went. Uh, yeah, I went back to the army. Okay. Okay. And so that was nine or ten months, and then where did you go from there? We went to Santa Ana, California, which is an air base. Okay. From Santa Ana, we went to Monterey for four weeks. And then we went to, to um, it's called Carabell, Florida, but it's about 60 miles south of Tallahassee. And we were there for about three months. Wow. And we trained uh, with an amphibious group, and uh, even though I didn't want, I wasn't a great swimmer, nevertheless, I wanted an amphibious boat outfit. Huh. So, did you, so what were your duties as part of the Air Corps? I mean, did you were training? Yeah, I, I was training um, as an air cadet. Yeah, we, we were learning to fly. Really? So you do you, you so you flew we, a plane? We, we flew briefly, not, not very long. Okay. Really, what kind of uh, planes did you fly? They were just Piper Cubs. Huh. Um, it was you know, I don't know very much about Piper Cubs. Like yeah. how many? Is it uh, what, what was the purpose of the of the flight and uh, how many people could fit in the well, plane? Well, it was it, it was number one. Uh, uh, how can I put it? It wasn't very mechanical. It was a very basic plane, and uh, it, it uh, seated two people, one behind the other, and uh, the instructor was, was sat in the front seat, and, I, and, and we cadets sat in the back. Okay. One, only one, one cadet and one instructor to a plane. Okay. And um, we're um, so when when training was done with that, we learned we learned to, to fly. Yeah. Um, uh, what would you do? What would the Piper Cub? Uh, well, we, our next was to go to, to pr a primary, a primary plane. I forget what it was called. And then from a primary, you went to a secondary plane, and from there, you you, you went to the last plane for training. Okay. It's, it's but, a, but I was in '43, and the war was over in '45. I see. Okay. So, <clears throat> and we went overseas in 1944. In August of '44. Okay. So, um, did you fly then? You you flew. No, when we when I went in the uh, about to Santa Ana, California, they eliminated us from the cadet program, 
and we just went back in the Army, the Army we'd been in before. And uh, we went overseas in that Army, and uh, we were stationed in England when we first went there. And we were stationed in England for about four months. Now how did you get... And then, and then from England we went over by boat to, uh, to the continent okay. and landed in France. Where, did, where in France did you land? Boy, I should have thought about this ahead of time. The heart, I think, was much more. So, and was it in Normandy? Right, 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 right across to Normandy. Okay. okay. But it was, it was uh, the invasion was in, the, in uh, June from 6. Uh -huh. And we didn't get over there for nothing until about two months later. Oh, I see, okay. So, it'd be like around August? Right. Okay. Is it, this is 1944. Four. Okay. Um, so did you land on, was it a, a, a beach? I mean, like, what's, how did you, did you land no, at what? A, no, by that time, the, the advanced troops had been all the way to Paris. And um, we joined, I can't remember the name of the office anymore. I've joined so many. But anyways, we uh, we walked <laughs> halfway to the to Rhine River, that was, which is on the Belgium, uh, Belgium, Jordan, Belgium, German border. We really, it's a little complicated, but they, um, we were briefly in George Patton's army, and we went through Luxembourg on the way to Germany. And um, we stayed in Luxembourg for a short time, and then we headed for Germany. And we wound up at the Rhine River in Germany, just before the end of the war. <coughs> I was 19, I think, at the time, and the, and the kids and the people who were still youngsters <coughs> were sent back to Paris, France. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> we went back to France and retrained, and we were, we were heading for Japan. And because it was the end of the war, they took the they thought us who hadn't been overseas that long which included me, I was only overseas about eight months at the time. And we were, they were intended that we were going to uh, go to Japan. Mm -hmm. But at the time, they, they dropped the nuclear bomb. And when they dropped the bomb, um, we, were, we went just about everywhere all over the world, our outfit. But I, uh, they asked me to take some training. And uh, at the time, the war was over. And in addition to basic training, I did some, uh, some bookkeeping, bookkeeping training and so forth. And instead of sending me over to Japan, which the war was already over, we were sent up to Berlin. And we were among the first troops up in Berlin. And we were there, and we, and we were heading for training there. Um, it was sheer anarchy. We went there, and it was the first time these, these people had been in peacetime, and the generals and everybody else. And they really didn't know quite what to do and are terribly disorganized. Berlin was uh, divided into four areas, the British, the, the Russians, the uh, French, and the United States uh, divided Berlin and also Germany into four sections. And uh, nationally, I, I went, went up to the United S S section. And after being there a while, I was just surely bored because they, they sent us out of Reveille at 6.30 in the, in the morning. That was the end of our day. Really? We had nothing to do because they weren't organized very well. Mm -hmm. And I did it for about four weeks and I just sat down I wanted to find something to do. So I volunteered. I went up to General Clay's office and I, I didn't know General or General Clay, but I was in his public relations department. And I was there for only for about three or four months and then I came back to, to the United States. And in between, I went up to um, while I was in Berlin, and I was uh, in General Clay's office, I still was not very active, and so I volunteered to go to school, and I went back to London for three or four weeks. And then I came back from London, back to Berlin again. And I came home in January, I think it was, in 45. Okay. Wow. So there's, yeah, there's definitely, you travel a lot and have a lot of oh, uh, yeah. experiences. Yeah. Um, so what, um, where did you go when you just mentioned you went to London to get uh, training in, uh, in, in General Clay's? It, it, it was a school of no consequence. 
It was supposed to be business training at some time, civilian business training for our future. Okay. And I, I got there two weeks late because uh, I decided I want to go to Paris instead of to London. And I had a friend of mine at, at the airport in Tempelhof in Berlin. And I called him up and I said, I says, I don't have tick the right tickets, but can you get me on a plane to go to Paris? And he said, sure. And because it was, I would, by this time I had been overseas about a year, and we didn't get paid because we were on the move all the time, and there was no point in using, we didn't have any money to use, but we didn't need it. Finally, after a year, we got paid for the whole year. So I had quite a bit of money in my top pocket. I was 19 years old, and I wanted to go to Paris. Sure. And I went to Paris, and I had one heck of a good time. What did you do when you were there? Well, for girls. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, so I, I, you know, what, what did I do there? T talking about jazz, there was a famous musician, never no, uh, music writer, whose book I had read back in when I was about 17, 18 years old. Okay. And uh, I found out that he was in Paris at the time. Really? So I looked him up. And I went up to his apartment to see him. And I told him that I was a writer for a jazz magazine in the United States, which I wasn't. And he says, well, come in and watch what we're doing. And he was teaching piano to about a half a dozen kids, jazz piano. Really? And this was just after the war. The war was over in August, I think August 8th. And this might have been the end of August that I was in, in France for the first time. And uh, the second time when I went to France, I went up to see him. And he was teaching his kids piano, and I was amazed. And in between, I went to quite a few uh, uh, nightclubs that had jazz programs. Really? Included a couple of very famous uh, jazz musicians who I don't remember either. There was one that came from Belgium, and he was a um, he was a strange he had a strange background, but he was a very famous guitar player. And if you ask jazz fans to this day, they talk about this guy. Really? So I, I went to, to see him. And when I went into the jazz club, it said no GIs allowed. I didn't want any American GIs there. Huh. There was a lot of problems in this club. They had fights and so oh. forth. But I wanted to go see him. So I came in, and I was told that the MPs came in, the military police come every day to, to, to pull you out if you're in there. So, this guitar player was playing in a small little band, about four, four members. And I went behind the band and sat in the back of them, so if somebody came in, they wouldn't see me. Oh, okay. <laughs> and sure enough, an MP came in, looked around and didn't see me, and went back out, and I stayed in South the GS program. But I liked the music very much. I bet, yeah, I bet that, at that yeah. time, too, it must have been a really vibrant atmosphere, too, oh, the end yeah. of the war. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. it was quite different. And some of the French, they weren't very, they were rather hostile toward us. A lot of the, the French had uh, allied in some ways with the Germans. Yeah. And they were free to, to wander around. And I went to one club once, and they were very hostile to me. Nobody wanted to talk to me. Really? And I was in uniform. And it was because the, uh, the French, I think, were not too happy with the fact the Americans were here. Yeah. Now, that doesn't apply to most of the French. Right. But there was, there was a large guard, I think, that, that were feeling that way. It's difficult, you know, that time, I wonder if there was, um, what did the city look like um, in terms of, were there still... Um, Fran Paris wasn't, uh, wasn't bombed. Uh -huh. And because of that, it, I mean, it was because, um, I think Hitler, Hitler wanted to bomb it like he bombed other cities. Mm -hmm. But there was somebody that was in a Ger German high staff who said uh, no. He says, look, they got so many museums right. and so many uh, uh, outstanding things that they, they think the history was not going to bomb Paris. Yeah. So they didn't. And as a result of it, Paris recovered so the civilian lives very, very, quite rapidly. Though they, they didn't have a lot of food needed. I was going to ask about that. And I wonder if there were lines to get, get well, food. Or, uh, well, I'll, we had a military camp that I was in for a short time, and uh, we, we we were eating outdoors, and uh, and and as only luxurious G GIs would do, we throw out our food in the garbage. Half of the food, if we didn't like it, we threw it in the garbage can. And there was a line of French people who were standing out there, and waiting to 
we left, we left so they could go in the garbage can and get, get their food out. Mm -hmm. And for their, for their meals, because they didn't have enough of the food. They felt, we felt sorry for them. And um, subsequently, uh, the Paris improved because I went back a few couple months later, but it hasn't improved that much. Yeah. People in Europe were, were, were hungry all over. In Germany, where it was, um, in Berlin, there, there used to be people, I mean, even though the Germans suffered probably worse than most people, um, the people that were in the upper classes in Germany probably didn't, uh, didn't feel too badly that uh, the war had ended. And I remember the subway was still in, was exist, in existence in Berlin. And often while we were waiting for, for the, uh, the train to come, we'd be standing on, in the subway. Uh -huh. And here'd be a man in a, in a beautiful coat with, with a velvet uh, uh, oh. neckline oh. and so forth, and fur on their mouth and a fur hat. And he dressed like something that was quite substantial. And he had a long stick with a nail on the end of it. And what he did, he went, walked around the, the station, this who I believe was, would have been a wealthy man. And when he saw, when he saw cigarettes that the Americans had thrown on the ground without finishing the, there was still tobacco inside the paper. They would take their stick with the nail and stick it in the cigarettes and open up the paper and throw it the tobacco in a little package that they had there yeah. so that they could get cigarettes to smoke. Well, you learned to, to save. Story, yeah, but that's the way it was. We learned to save, you know, what you can that's and right. what you can. Um, that's right. Was it, so when um, you know talking about Berlin, um, yeah. you know, um, and I, could you move uh, between the four sections of when it was divided up? No, but I was um, because I was a private, and I went in this public relations department. I was the only one that wasn't an officer, and as a result of it. I was, I had really a very high position. I would be the, uh, um, I forget what you call him, the gopher, who would go from to France to uh, to, Jer to um, Russia to, to uh, England to pick up my, uh, papers for, for the officers sure. in our organization and then I'd return. Right. And, uh, How did you get from I, place to place? I, did you I just had, walk from checkpoint no, to checkpoint? No, they, they gave me they gave me an officer's truck. They have a big star on the side. It might have been the generals, as far as I know. And they'd see, see me in the back, and then they would drive me around. Really? And, and I had that big star on, on the truck. So when we passed soldiers that were standing at attention, uh -huh. as the truck, when they saw the star, they all came to attention. <laughs> and they would salute as I went by. And I was a private, I wasn't an officer. I used to open up the one local, as only a kid would do. <laughs> you know, like that, so. Was it, um, so, so, how, silly story. Well, no, 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 this is all, this is great to know. <laughs> These are stories that I don't know. Um, yeah. The, uh, so, I mean, we, would you, uh, you said your, your, your job was essentially as a gopher. Would you, were, yeah. were you doing that every day? Going well, no, I, I was in a department that we wrote home public relations releases, releases on many of the soldiers that were in Berlin. Okay. And if, uh, Say some, some, somebody was from Chicago that asked me to, to write a, 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 a news release and then send it in the, the, the press in, in Chicago. I line. see, okay. So, so it was really the first time I did much writing. The first writing I did in the service, which wasn't very much, on the ship that I was going overseas with, mm -hmm. it was called the Mara Post, I believe. Right. And it was a sister ship of a very famous ship, a civilian ship during war, before World War II. The Mauritania, I believe it was called. Oh, really? Okay. And the Mariposa was a sister ship. And it was 5,000 of us that went over the ship. We didn't have an escort because a ship could go faster than a submarine. Okay. The submarines were underwater, so it slowed them down. And they figured that we didn't need an escort. And was, there was a good chance it would get over across to Europe um, without again, getting hurt by submarines. And so we slept on the, on the deck. Huh. And all of us slept on the deck. And uh, there were 5,000 of us on the ship. It was a huge ship. And um, on the second day I was on the deck, uh, they called and said, we're going to have a newsletter aboard the ship. And anybody that's got any background in news writing uh, should come downstairs and you can, you can be on the paper. 
So I ran downstairs and they gave me and they gave me one page to myself and I could write down anything I wanted. What did you write? Uh, about about what goes on aboard deck. Huh. I wrote about a crap game and one of the guys who played aboard a ship. Okay. And uh, it was a silly thing for me to do, and I had nothing to write. Well, you know, that's, that's what happens. I mean, yeah, these, yeah. these are the things kind of the, the in between stuff. But, that's but anyway, so here I was uh, on the deck, and again, I'm one of the lowest ranking men. Most of the fellows had it were uh, non cop, were in the, they weren't officers, but they were sergeants and they were corporals. And my first first sergeant was first sergeant was probably as the most important man on, in the company, and uh, he was aboard. And he had to lie on the deck too for the seven days it took to get, go overseas. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the, after I worked on the paper for the day, they gave me a suite, and yeah. I had a suite all to myself. That's nice. And I lived that way, and I guess I must say, hey, with the officers too. So for seven days, I lived I lived like a, a king. And the first first sergeant was so angry that the fact that I didn't have any rank, I hadn't been in service that long, and here I was. Uh, eating with the officers and living in a suite by myself, right. and he was sleeping on aboard the deck for the whole seven days. Was it, had you um, had you worked in a newspaper in high school or at the? the I had college? worked in junior college in a short time. Uh, I think I was sports editor of the paper. Okay. For a very short time. What did you? What did you? I had my first time I ever wrote. There's a small community. That, in fact, I still live out there in the summertime. Uh, they used to have a, new, a little newspaper that came out every week. And uh, they asked me to write a column for a teenage column. So I, it was the first time I ever wrote for a paper. And I was about six, 15 or 16 at the time. And I wrote for the paper. And um, to, just every week, and that was my only newspaper background. And I didn't, I didn't write in high school. I played quite a few sports. And. Um, I really didn't have time for more than that. But you knew, you know, you know the stories. You know, yeah. you know when a story is a story, and you know, talk from talking with people, um, kind of yeah. uh, being in the midst of things. Yeah. And what you hear. Yeah, that's, that's sports that are, you know, yeah, I used to cover swimming, which I did not, never had seen it before, and track. I, I covered the track of, for the sports column, and I played basketball in, in, in junior college too, but. Uh, it was not particularly significant. Well, right, but I mean, it's you know you're interacting with people and, and oh yeah, sure. You know, knowing um, yeah, but I, I just had three months at the time. That was the first time that I, I really wrote for a school paper. And so, so you used you know you, you talked about that when they asked for if anyone had experience, and then you yeah. you, know, you did this one page. Yeah. Do you still have a copy of that 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 uh, what was what you wrote? I don't think so. Okay. Um, I think the teenage, the teenage paper I do have. I see. One of, I, I, I save the papers, I believe. What, um, so in, um, in Berlin, oh, mm -hmm. you, were, you were writing these press releases. Uh, were they on, um, you know, did you cover a certain area was it about Chicago, or, or is it just no, generally the about, about was what, what Joe, Joe Smith was doing okay. in Berlin at the time, or, okay. or if he had been in the, in combat before, you know, and then he wound up coming to Berlin. Any, anything that might have been of interest for Joe Smith. And many of the towns I wrote for were just small little towns. Mm -hmm. So everybody in the town knew everybody else. Sure. So it was very interesting for them to find out what was going on. How, how was the, were the press releases uh, relayed to the, the hometown papers? Was it, how were they sent over? I don't know. I, I recall that uh, we, we sent, Send our releases to whoever was in charge, okay. and uh, I don't know how they sent them. They, they might have done by telephone or telegraph. Okay. I, I really don't know. Okay. Um, so how many of these uh, press releases would you have written a day? I mean, was the news coming in, or were people? Well, um, I, you'll forgive me. It, it's been seven years. Oh, that's. I, <laughs> don't I don't remember very well. I don't even know. I mean, that might have been one day where I did it two or three, and one I might have done a half a dozen. Yeah. So it sounds like you, you know, you, you, you know, whatever they needed done in the office, yeah. and, you know, you used your writing skills, your 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 right. reading skills to, to right. be able to. Right. You know, um, what were some of the other t um, uh, uh, jobs or things that you did while you were in Berlin? Um, one of the jobs that uh, I never talked about 
is they had a black market in Berlin, a terrific black market. And I don't know where the Germans got their money, but they were paying $100 for a cargo of cigarettes. So one of the reasons I didn't tell you when I went to, over to London, that's what I went over for, really. And I had, to only get there, I had a joy to go to school somewhere. So I went overseas, and I didn't have a suitcase. I used to have a barracks bag that I threw all my clothes in. <laughs> when I got to London, I emptied my barracks bag and went over to a place where the GIs were living in London. And they were selling cigarettes for three dollars a cart. Yeah. So I bought about three dollars a cart. I don't know, but I bought, I bought about quite a few, I don't know, maybe 50 cartons or so. Really? Okay. And then when I got back to Berlin, and I filled my barracks bag with them, and when I got back to Berlin, I went to, to where they were selling the cigarettes for $100 a carton, and I made about five or six thousand dollars. Oh my gosh. Except they had a rule that you couldn't send home more than what you were paid. Well, my salary for the whole time was maybe about 50, about maybe $2,000 for, for the whole year. Oh my gosh. So that's all they would allow me to send home. So what did you do with that so extra did, money? So that $2,000, well, in Berlin it was crazy. I, I went and I bought a radio for $700, I remember, because I had so much money. And it was crazy. I, um, I went to, I, there were a few restaurants that I went to that were pretty expensive sure. because I had all that excess money. Right. I was spending, it had cost me maybe $150 for dinner or something because I couldn't get the money home. Right, right. I figured better to spend it that way than no way. Why but the money that I brought home, I went to college in the GIE. Uh, in the GIE. Uh, well, yeah, I was going to ask you that. In, in, in 1946. Okay. And the GIE paid for my schooling. But I sold into cash, and that money that I made in Berlin put me through college, and uh, I think bought my wife an engagement ring. Wow. Because well, I didn't have any cash before that. that. <laughs> now, had you met your wife before you went into the service, or did you? Uh, yeah. After the war. After the war, okay. Yeah. I, was, I, was only, I was only about 20, 20 21 okay. when I went to uh, Illinois. Was, um, what, uh, so you went to, did you, University of Illinois? Is that where yeah. you went? Okay. Yeah, Champaign. Where did, where did, what did you major in? They have what's, what's called for veterans, the, the division, some, some kind of division for, for war veterans. And I just took classes. I could take any class that I wanted. In my freshman year, I took a senior class. In my senior year, I took a freshman class. I, I didn't have to have any prerequisites. And the only thing I had to do was accumulate hours. Then to graduate, I had to accumulate 128 hours. So when I started college, I took tests and I, and I got 18 hours in a test, not because I was that smart, but because something else, uh, the reason I was getting it was for, they wanted to get us through school as fast as I can. When I went down to Illinois in 46, there were 20,000 students down there, and the year before the war, and before it started in Illinois, there was only 7,000. Mm -hmm. So suddenly they had 13,000 more students down there. Right. They didn't have dormitories for them. I slept in the ice rink for one one semester. Really? Because there was no place to sleep. What, is it on a cot or something like that? Or well, it was just on, on the oh. cement floor. Really? But they had four decker beds all over the ice rink. And I, and I said that. And I uh, slept down there. So how long did it take? Did you, was it less than four years then to complete since you got I only was there for about two and a half years. Two and a half years, okay. But I was in summer school for three years. Okay. And I, I, and I was started with 34 hours when I started. They had given me some of, because I went, I went to Gettysburg College during the war for about, the, oh, when I was in the cadet program. Oh, okay. And well, we were flying part-time. Is that in Pennsylvania? Is it? In Gettysburg, okay. Pennsylvania. Okay. And I was, um, uh, there were really only one semester, and I must have gotten credit for that, because mm -hmm. I wound up at 34 hours. Okay. And then I got... I took about 30 hours the first year, so 34 and 30 is 64. Then, an eight, then I went to summer school for 18 hours. 30, uh, 64 and 18 is 82 hours. At the end of the first year, I had 82 hours. It was silly, really, because they were really anxious to just push us through because they couldn't handle all these. And what we had in those days, we had lecture 
halls of 600, uh, 200 students, and that's all. We never met the professor that was lecturing, and that's all we did was uh, we, we had a discussion group maybe once a week, mm -hmm. and they lectured twice a week, but we never ever met any, any of the faculty. At Gettysburg, we used to, the faculty was, uh, it was a small school, it was 1,500 students, and at nighttime we'd go over to the professor's house, and it was very social, but it was always, uh, you know, it was quite scholastic. It was, it was a very nice way to go to school. Yes, yeah, different, different. Uh, we got a range of, of experiences there, oh, uh, yeah. the larger school and oh, the smaller yeah. ones. So, what did you, um, so after college, after you graduated? Oh, what? and then I, um, um, I went to college in 42, in 46 to 49. And I got married before we got out of school. I was I still had about eight hours to go. Okay. And um, and I didn't have a uh, I and I went I, I took quite a few advertising courses. So I went around to the advertising agencies on North Michigan on South Michigan Avenue in North Michigan. And every day I'd go out and I would go in to see people that were running the agency, and I was trying to get a job. And I did it for about 12 weeks, and I finally got one job. And I went down there, I must be honest with you what happened. I went down there, and I, when I was interviewed, I walked in, it was the winter time, and uh, the, the man that interviewed me and hired me um, was impressed with me. And he said, I had 25 or 30 other people here, but you get the job. And I couldn't understand it, because I wasn't that impressive. But I went in, and when I went in, instead of being intimidated by the interview, I just took my coat and I flung, flung it on a, on a sofa. And I didn't do it on purpose, I just wouldn't, I just did it. But I didn't do it to be a wise guy, I just tossed it down. And that impressed him, the fact that I was uh, not intimidated by him. So he said, he said, I'm hiring you over the other people, come in Monday morning. So I came in on Monday morning, and he said, before, we start. He says, I want to interview you a little more. So he says, you were in the Army, and you were how old? Were you in a fraternity down at school? What kind of social activities did you have? He says, are you Jewish or Catholic? Or are you, are you, um, I think it was Catholic, I'm not sure. He says, are you Jewish or Catholic? I says, I'm Jewish. So after a few more questions, he says, I've got to interview a few more people. He says, come back at 1 o'clock. And I came back at 1 o'clock, and the girl said, she hired somebody else. Yeah. And what the, what the reason for it was, was because when I said, are you Jewish or not? That was the reason I didn't get the job. After 14 or 15 weeks. Mm -hmm. So my wife's father had a, a, a store in uh, Chicago. And the first four or five years of uh, our marriage, I worked in the store. Didn't like it one bit. And that's when I started the newspaper. I was, I'd like to talk uh, about working in, in starting the newspaper. I, I wondered, um, yeah. since uh, since you are Jewish, how was it? How was it being in the war um, in Europe? Um, how much did only, you know? Only one time did I ever have a problem. It wasn't much of a problem. Um, I never had any problem from anti-Semitism. But one day in the barracks, one of these guys started popping off, and he says the Jews run everything. He says, they read absolutely everything. And I've heard this ten times, and every, every Jewish person's heard it. So I was a couple of beds away from him, I says, what are you talking about? I says, I'm a private. I says, I, I do the, the worst things that there are in this outfit. I, I do everything. Uh, and when I go out to, to uh, shoot a machine gun, I'm at the bottom of the rank. When, when we throw grenades, I'm at the very bottom of the rank. And so he, so I said, and I'm Jewish. I said, so what's the big deal whether, whether you're Jewish or not? Yeah. He says, well, I want to ask you something. And I says, what? He said, what, what is the first sergeant? We had three enlisted men. And the first sergeant, as I told you before, was the major, major man in the army at that level. And he says, what religion is the guy that's uh, first sergeant? And I says, well, he's Jewish. He says, right. And he says, "How about the guy that's the head of the head of the head of the um, PX, which is where we got all our clothes?" And that was an important job in, in our outfit. 
I said, yeah, he was Armenian. He was Jewish too. And then there was another position. Oh, it, it was uh, the, <laughs> the food department. And uh, that was an important part of the department to feed 300 men. And he says, how about the guy that's in charge of that department? And I said, you're right. Yeah. He says, he was Jewish. And he says, so I'm right. He says, look at all the Jews who are running the outfit. And I just laughed because it was, it was, I, Jews are a little more than 1% of the United States population. So it wasn't very often I even met anybody that was Jewish. Yeah. Was, how much did you know, um, you know, about, uh, you, you went in, you know, yeah, 43. 43, and you, you were you over, you landed in, in France in 44. Mm -hmm. How much did you know about um, concentration camps and... Um, well, what can uh, The concentration camps, how much did you know concentration about... Concentration camps? Yeah, how much did you know about Very that? Little. Very little. Very little. And most of us didn't find out about them until the very end. I was at the Rhine River when uh, the war, when I ended for me, they sent, I told you, they sent us younger people back about a year. About a year a month before the war ended, and um, I might have heard about them, but I never, I never saw a camp, and I, I wasn't that far from me either. Mm -hmm. I might have been a hundred yards, a hundred miles away. Really? Yeah. And had, had I known about them, I hopefully would have volunteered to do something about it, you know, yeah. to at least go in there and help them out. Right. But um, I, I really didn't hear much about them until I got back to Paris. Okay. And by that, I mean back to London. So, uh, so you know, to Paris, we're, we're, we were camping in Paris for about uh, a month, a month and a half before we went to Berlin. And uh, at the time, I, I don't think I heard anything about them until like, I got to Berlin. Okay. So, um, so just uh, going through uh, kind of the, the sure. timeline here, um, uh, um, go through the, the uh, it says, okay, which outfit were you in um, in the infantry? Was it? You wrote your 341st, does that say harbor? Oh, 341st, it was put, an outfit called a harbor craft outfit. Harbor craft. And we were affiliated with an amphibious outfit. Okay. And the crazy thing about it is we were trying for, to, to make amphibious landings. When we got to, uh, to, uh, to France, the war, the war had gone all the way to Paris. And all the amphibious work that they went to get on to Normandy, uh, it was two months uh, later. And by that time, the troops got as far as Paris. When we got to the Rhine River, there was a, <coughs> there was a fam famous area called Remagen. Remagen, Remagen, Belgium, which is right on the Belgian, Belgian German uh, border. And uh, when the Americans crossed into Germany, they came to the Rhine River and the Marumaga Bridge was over the river. And immediately the Germans bombed the bridge. So we had a hard time getting across. And um, when we uh, couldn't get across, they, they built a pontoon br uh, bridge. Huh. So we were able to get across the, the uh, bridge. Now, what I wanted to say was, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought. We're talking about the 341st um, Harbor Crown. Yeah, at the time. The but we, we left that off, but even that, we were, oh, we were still, we still had this amphibious background. And we figured we were at the river, and we would help get the troops across the river. Okay. And uh, instead they said, because the Navy has so much experience in Normandy, we're bringing the Navy to the Rhine River and they're going to bring the troops across. So here we were trained to do that, and they never even let us do it. So we, as I said, because we were, we were young, we were sent back to, to France, and we, we never did any of the amphibious work. And, I mean, everybody was in combat service, maybe 10% of them were only. And we didn't see any real combat. But at, at the Rhine River, there was a machine gun that went but we really weren't in combat. Uh, but those things did happen occasionally. What was the scene, you know, as you were, you know, surveying and looking out at, at the, the land of, there in France? I mean, what were you seeing from when you, you know, in Normandy um, as you moved towards Paris? Nothing. It was just, it was just, you know, about, Normandy was only probably about 120 miles to Paris. 
and uh, normally it was June 6 of 45, and our, our troops landed in, in, went into Paris in the beginning of August. So they were they were on land the whole time. Well, did you? I mean, were, were, and, and as far as we were, we were concerned, we were be, behind the troops actually, uh -huh. the ones who went to Paris. Right. We weren't first in Paris, but but when um, when the war was over, let's see now. Boy, my memory is terrible. When the war was over. I was sent back to Paris to train again, mm -hmm. and I went into uh, Paris on VE Day, which was the day when, they, when they, it was a celebrating right. the V Day Day. And the only thing I remember about it was in Paris is they had bonfires all over the city. On just on the streets? Yeah. Just, wow. On the bonfires, but just they were celebrating. Uh -huh. and they had big bonfires all over, and um, I went in for that day, and the other day I went in too. Um, the French. Um, celebrate their freedom from the 1890s when they, uh, uh, when, when, when Napoleon's brother, I think, was in charge of, of uh, France in those days. And they, and they fought for uh, their democracy back in those days. Mm -hmm. And they were celebrated also in Paris for one day. Oh, I and I remember I went in that day also to, to say, what? It wasn't significant as far as the war went. Right, but right. I, but I always picture that. Sure. Was it was it talking talking about VE Day? Uh, you saw these bonfires, and were there people around the bonfires? Were people throwing wood oh. or just celebrating? Uh, like, what was I, I suppose so. You know, I should. I suppose they were drinking. You right. Know, and they were just having a good time. That's all. Do you remember which uh, which neighborhood of Paris you might have been in, or um, which area? No, I really don't. How did you get from? I, I was uh, in the. Um, I should have, I should have read a little bit about this. That's that's okay. That's okay. I'm going to ask yeah. lots of questions. So, how did you get from from Berlin to Paris? Did you just take the train or did you fly? No, I think we went by truck. Oh, by truck. You yeah. did. Okay, you took it. Yeah. You? Yeah, we, I'll tell you something that was interesting. The day we went back was April 12, 1945. What was significant about April 12th is President Roosevelt died that day. Oh. And because he died that day, um, it had nothing to do with us coming back. But uh, it was by coincidence, we, we were in trucks and they drove us back toward France. And Belgium and France are right next to each other. So it was Luxembourg, right next to France. And then one day, we went by truck from, from uh, the Rhine River in Germany to Belgium, crossed over into Luxembourg, and wound up in France. They were all close together. Right. And what was interesting to me was here we went to Belgium, who, well, they were a lie of ours, and also in Luxembourg, too. Um, they weren't an ally until after the end, just about the end of the war. But uh, they all had flags at half mass for Roosevelt really? on the day that he died, and everybody hmm. had their flags up. And really, unlike uh, most presidents, well, it was a war, and Roosevelt was very significant in his position as far as the rest of the world went. Absolutely. You, did, you know, you, you talked about um, buying that uh, radio. Yeah. What were, um, oh. did you listen, what were some of the programs that you, what were the, the things that you heard I, on the radio? I, I try to listen to music really, huh? Okay, so, so it's, you yeah. listen to a lot of jazz? Yeah, and maybe you hope so, too. Right. <laughs> those days, Frank Sinatra was becoming popular. Okay. And I remember they had a mama all the time singing. And then, you know, that's it. Man. It was the first time I, I really felt homesick. Was um, so let me ask. So you felt homesick? Were you? Um, how did you communicate with your family back home? By, by what they call uh, V-mail letters. Okay. They were letters that were censored, and it was, it was just a small letter, and then you you, you sealed it, and uh, then they, when I went to the officers in your department in your outfit. They would uh, unseal them and read it first, and if there was something that they didn't like in it, they'd, they'd cross it out. So how would they cross it out? Just put like, they'd, they'd just scratch exit it out? out like, they would scratch it out. Huh. How did you and, seal them? I think if we, you know, we might be angry at an officer or something. Sure. And we say, Captain, so-and-so is a son of a gun, or stronger language. Right. <laughs> so, so, so when they heard that, they scratched it all out, because they, they didn't want 
uh, Mr. Vignon and about the captain or anything else. That, and, and they didn't even want the officers above them. The officer who might have been a second lieutenant was censoring him. And the might have gone up to some uh, officer higher up. And we might have said, um, you know, the Germans were, were uh, three miles away from us or three yards away from us. Right. And uh, they didn't want, it, especially during the war, they didn't want it to be known to the enemy that uh, yeah, what we were writing about was about them. Yeah, there's, I understand the reasons yeah. during war times. Oh, yeah. sure. Um, did you get letters? So were, did you and receive we got, letters? And we got, we got um, regular letters from our family. Okay. And again, they censored them also. And they, sorry? And they censored the letters also. Oh, they censored the letters that you received? Both received really? that and which we sent out. Huh. But it was, uh, I quite can't give you an example of what they would have said. But again, I suppose if a citizen, if a, a person, a civilian, said something nasty about the military, the army, they just, you know, scratch it off. And, I, and we were getting letters from other soldiers around, around the world, you know, friends that we knew in civilian life. And, uh, you know, they, they might have written something that they shouldn't have written about. Really? You know, they might have invaded some yeah. someplace over in the Pacific. Sure. And it scratched it out. Did you get some of the, some of the letters from the friends that were... Oh, uh, sure. Where, where were some yeah. of the places that they were writing from or writing about? Well, let's see, I had a, a friend that was in the submarines. And he took, wrote about submarines, huh. and uh, as I told you, I didn't, I didn't like to go in the Navy because I'm not swimming. Yeah. And I went up to see him, and he was in Washington one time. And when I was in Gettysburg, it was only about 50 miles away, 100 miles away. And I went to see him one weekend, and I asked him, I says, where's the branch of the Navy are you in? And he says, in the submarine branch. And I says, you're out of your mind. I says, why would you go in the submarines? That's a horrible thing. And it's so dangerous. And he says, well, what, are you, what branch are you on? And I says, I'm in the Air Corps. And he says, in the Air Corps? He says, he says I wouldn't dare fly. And he wound up, he, he's, he's, his journals are back on, it was terrific. He went to work for Walter Cronkite. Did you ever hear Walter Cronkite? Yeah, yeah. He went to walk, he went to, for CBS. Really? And, uh, and they proofread all the copy that went to Walter, Walter, Cron, Walter Cronkite. And, um, and he said, that, as I said, that he was in submarines. And because I was afraid of the water, I thought it was awfully dangerous. And I was willing to fly because I, I didn't see anything wrong right. with it. Right. And when Walter Crane came, came in from New York to Chicago, he brought him along with him. And my friend went in a train to come in, and Crank had flew in. And my friend refused to get an appointment at that time. Really? Wow. He has overcome it now. He's still, he's still there. How did, you, the how did you meet him? Did you meet him through the Army? Or? Well, when we were kids. Okay, so you had a long time. I was 10 years old. Yeah, wow. So you're both in the news business. And so after the yeah. war, you, 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 you get your bachelor's degree. Right. And then you, and you work, uh, you said you worked for a time for your, your wife's father. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then you decided to go into newspapers? Um, yeah. Okay. I, I was in uh, my wife's father's business for about five years. Okay. And it's just the liquor business. Oh, okay. And from then, from then I, uh, I told my wife, I, I've got to do something else. And so, in our community, uh, I lived in Niles at the time. Are you familiar with the, with the area or not? I, I'm learning it. I'm learning oh, it. Learning well, it. It's just another suburb called Suburbs Over. And um, I noticed that the news we got were from other suburbs, Park Ridge, Skokie, Glenview and the Plains, and all the papers come from these other communities that came to Niles, and they covered Niles too, primarily for the advertising. And uh, we weren't getting any news in there. There wasn't any news from any of these papers from Niles. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, there's an opportunity here. Right. And I thought that uh, if we could really work uh, at covering it in the town, why the, the people would react to the paper. Sure. So I named the paper The Bugle, which was a corny name. And the reason for it is because before I started the paper, I went to the library and I went through all the newspapers in America and what their names. And most papers' names of the Times, the News, and so forth. And I thought, 
That's awfully common. How can I, how can I, how can I name the paper something so people will, will recognize it right away? Right. So when I came across the name Bugle, I started laughing at it. And I thought, what a joke to have the name Bugle for your paper. And I just said, maybe not. <coughs> it might be significant enough for people to pay attention to it. So that's how I named it the Bugle. So, so you found it in the paper, or is it, were you? The, or you, you found it in the paper, or were you, were you the publisher? The, the, the I was the publisher. Publisher, and yeah. publisher, and editor of the of the. I did everything. You did everything. I, I would be, in the beginning. I would write in the write the news during the during the daytime most of the time. I would cover meetings mostly at nighttime. The village board, the park board, the zoning board. Okay. The, um, and three or four other boards were. Uh, meeting at night time, so I'd cover them, and then uh, in the daytime I'd type out what I had written. And, uh, and then in the afternoon I'd go out and get advertising. That's and I, I, was, I was one of my newspapers. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. And then I hired, hired my first employee, and uh, she uh, took to a, a computerized, one of the first computerized machines I bought. Uh, she, she was able to type out what I, on the machine. And subsequently, we pasted this copy down on paper. Right. And we created a dark room. And I worked the dark room. And I shot the negatives for this. And then what we did is we burned the negative on a metal plate. Okay. On an aluminum plate. And that was uh, the beginning of offset. Are you familiar with offset, well, Freddie? I get it. So let's see, my first job in the newspapers was at a weekly. And at that point, they yeah. were doing, you know, they paste the copy on the board. On the board. Yeah, and then they were, that paper, they were gradually moving into computers and doing layout of the computers. Right, and like that, right, so. right. And that, that's how we started. And then uh, from that, then I got a couple more girls who worked in the office. And uh, as the paper got bigger, we were started out, I think we were eight page tabloid. Uh -huh. And when we finished, we were about 40 pages. Was it, so, uh, was, it, was the paper, uh, is, is it still, is it still yeah, one, yeah. Okay. I saw, we sold it. You sold it? Okay, yeah. so it was like a family, it was a family owned, uh, you owned the, the paper and then did you sell it, sold it to a, to a, to, to a fellow who, who had to work for the Tribune. Really? And uh, I thought he was crazy for doing it, a terrific job. He, uh, he was the representative of the, of the Tribune. And anybody that wrote, wrote a, a comic in the Tribune paper, or rather a column, news column, or an editorial, so they sold them, on, sold them to the papers all over the country. Mm -hmm. And then selling them all over the country, this fellow was in charge to, to, to decide what papers they want to use. And I thought he had a terrific job. And then he came to me and he, and he said, I've always wanted to own my own papers. And he said, uh, he says, I, I married a girl who happens to own 90 acres of property just outside Chicago. Well, property in those days was about $5,000 an acre. And she, in those days, it was a lot of money. So 90 acres times $5,000 was uh, whatever. I can't even figure it out. This property was about uh, close to a million dollars, I believe. Yeah. So he had money, and uh, he said he wanted to buy a paper. So I told him I was interested. I was interested in selling and. He didn't pay anything like that much for the paper, but he, he still paid enough for me to get out. Right. And um, so we we wound up, we started out with one person. We wound up with about 15 people. We had as many as five classified salesmen and three display salesmen, four, five display salesmen. And the rest of the people worked in the office. And we had two bookkeepers, uh -huh. and we had a, a girl that did editorial work. And um, we'd have a couple of news reporters that were just uh, freelance, mm -hmm. and they would just cover meetings for us. Sure. And, that, and that's what we had. So from one person, we went to about 15. That's great. That's yeah. Great. Well, it's, 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 and so when would be the years that you had, that you started to make the one? Was started in 57. Okay. And we didn't start really having, we, we only had one employee until about 1963. So it was just and you? And then I had my first, my first salesman then. And by 1970, we had three or four salesmen, okay. and plus two or three, two, two classified girls, the sole classified advertising. Oh. And that's where we had about the 1970s. And by the time uh, we sold the paper in the late 80s, I said, we wound up about 15 to 20 employees. Okay. We, had, we had a truck, and a truck driver. Um, 
What else? What was your, what was your, yeah, what your top, uh, s s um, how many subscribers did you have? The top number? We might have had maybe about, I don't, I don't want to exaggerate, we might have had 500 to 1,000 subscribers. Okay. But we, 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 sell, we, we distributed 9,000 papers. Yeah. And uh, because the other papers had subscribers too, they got 300 papers, 400 papers, 500 papers. Sure. And uh, when the advertising people went out to sell advertising, got space for their advertising, they said that they had 100% coverage in the towns, which they didn't have. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we did well was because we told them we had 100% of the coverage almost, and most of it was free. Uh -huh. And we could never get it. We never could have gotten more, maybe two, maybe 500 to 1,000 uh, subscribers in it. And we worked at it for a while, and we saw that we weren't getting very much. And all our competition had two or 300 uh -huh. or 500 uh, subscribers, and that's all the papers they had. Yeah. When we sold advertising, I uh, couldn't get an advertiser. And I would tell the advertiser, I tell you what, I said, um, I said, I, I, I'll be willing to give you a free end in the paper if you will run in the paper and put a coupon in the paper, such as we sell, we sell eggs for 50 cents. A, for, this, for this one, we sell eggs for 50 cents. Put the coupon in the paper and also put the ad in all the other papers and put the coupon in. And they did. And <clears throat> The first time we did that, we did that with a, a, a appliance dealer, and he got he got uh, 50 coupons from one of the papers, 75 from another, and 800 from us. Really? Wow! And we saw that the paper would pull with 800 yeah. coupons. We got the advertising from. That's fantastic. And we did that with a vegetable store in town. We did that with a grocery store in town, and that's how we got a lot of advertising. Was uh, did you? Um I mean, I know you, you had a experience, you know, with a, a community college or a junior college, and then in the war, you know, on the ship. Um, how did you learn, you know, the business side of, of journalism, and, you know, even the production side? How did you learn that? So, did you tour other newspapers? You talk to people? Did you? Yeah. Well, initially, um, the, the Despines paper, um, Primrose paper, okay. we brought the plates to them, okay. and then the plates would go on the press. And that would, would print the newspaper right on the press. And, uh, and I watched, watched what he did. He had the, the printing press and he had everything. And, and I watched what he did for a few months. And bit by bit, I just learned more. And I, I didn't have much background at all in journalism. What? But, I, uh, but I liked what I was doing very much. And uh, I, I had the paper in a, in a town, Niles. Mm -hmm which had a man by the name of Stankowitz. There was a book that written about him in, in 1900. And in 1900, he was a trustee. And in 1957, 19, when I started the paper, uh -huh. his grandson, named Stankowitz, was the mayor of the, was the, mayor of the town. Okay. So the Stankowitz family was running the town from 1900 to 1957. Really? And then, and that was, a, that was about 57 years. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, and the fellows on the, on the village board were all quite a bit older than me. None of them went to, went to college. Oh yeah, one man did. And he was a very bright guy. And none of the, the others had any educational background. And, uh, I didn't like what I saw. When they had a bid, and I had the trustees had a village bid. Say they were doing some sewer work in town. They had to hire, they had to get bids from sewer, sewer people. Right. And the lowest bid would get the job. Mm -hmm. And what happened when, when I was first starting the papers is one of the trustees, the trustees would bring in the bids, and that was okay. And then they would reopen up the bids right. at the meeting. Right. And, and maybe you've seen this. Yeah, yeah. And then the whole bid would usually get it. Right. One time, 
when they were out to do sewer work, they had a bid, and A, B, C, D, E, and F all bid, and F was the lowest bidder. And when they, when they said, F will do the job for $5,000, one of the trustees raised his hand, and he says, I forgot to handle and hand in this bid. And he handed in an open envelope bid. And naturally, yes. if they said it was $5,000, they read the bid, and who knows what it said on the piece of, like a blank piece of paper. Yeah. And they said, this guy bid $4,500. And they says, well, he gets the bid back. Right. Yeah. So I realized what was going on. Yeah. And then I realized also that each one of the trustees had a relationship with some kind of a company that was working in town. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. So, and yeah. so accordingly, they never got any money. But who knows what they got. Right, right. Well, that's it. And my, and my, big, my big thing in the paper <coughs> was they had gambling in town. Okay. And gambling was illegal in most of the towns. And I took a look at all of our village ordinances and so forth, and it was illegal in our town to have it also. But meanwhile, we had one iron armed band, you know what one armed band it is? It's a gambling machine we pull. Oh, okay. Down. All right, okay. It's like a slot machine type right, of. Yeah. Like a slot machine. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> I mean, hard time. Um, they had slot machines all over town. They had Cicero, Cicero, which is a major suburb, sub, subway in the Chicago outfit, always had hoodlums in the town. And they had the most gambling of any town in the state of Illinois, but mostly in the Chicago area, they certainly had most. And there were only one or two other towns that had any gambling at all. So I went to the police chief and I says, Chief, I says, how can we have gambling when, when we have a law uh, um, which, which states that no gambling is allowed. Right. And he says, don't talk to me. He says, go talk to the mayor. So I says, okay. So I went to talk to the mayor. This, he was Stankowitz, very nice guy, lovely guy. And I says, Frank, I says, I says why is it that uh, we have uh, gambling in this town? And he says, he says, but he says, I can't tell you about it. He says, go to the police chief. And I said, I just went to the police chief. <laughs> And he says, we'll go back to him. So that's, that's the way to handle it. Oh. So gambling was my big issue. So right. for three years, there wasn't a week went by. I wrote a column, and I always wrote about it. I says, if they can do things illegally so easily, yeah. what else do they do right. when it's illegal? Well, it's, you know, and as a result of it, in the 1961, there were four groups that uh, ran for office. One was the Democrats from Niles Township backed up uh, one group, group. One from Main Township had another group. And Niles, the village of Niles was divided into Main Township and Nine Township, Niles Township. So as a result of it, the Democrats represented one group, Democrats represented another one. A third group was represented by the Republicans in one of the townships. And the fourth group were a bunch of independents. Had no political background, were all college boys, and um, were all my age. We were about 31 years old then. Weren't much older than that. And uh, the week before they, they uh, ran for office, I endorsed them. And I was the only paper to endorse anybody. And I endorsed these four fellows. And, and one of the other groups, were the incumbents, and uh, they were either Democrats, they were Democrats, I believe, but I'm not sure. And uh, they, they were all running, and because they had been in office for so many years, they were absolutely sure that they are going to be elected. Right. So I went down to the, that evening, oh, and I, I endorsed uh, all these new boys only. They had no political background. Some of them were quite bright. And, um, the people that were running for office were for the mayor, that's Stankowitz, and he was rerunning in for about the tenth time. And the, uh, there were three, there were, I think, three or four trustees, and there was a village clerk. The village clerk was one of the old timers, old, old fellas, and, and, uh, and he was in the, with the incumbents 
when he ran for office. But he was, a, he was straight as an arrow. He was very conscientious, worked very hard. Everybody thought he was a terrific candidate. So we endorsed him also. And we endorsed all the young people otherwise. So there were four, there were 21 people running for office. And every one of the people that we endorsed won. Really? Yep. Wow. Substantially. They didn't just win. And the old part of town, who had, which had to run the town for many, who had run the town for many years, um, they were so sure of winning the election that they had been winning them for 10 years. And I stopped off at the police chief who was involved in the gambling that night. And he was very friendly to me. And he said, uh, and he says, well, we're count, counting the votes at, at our end of town and we're way ahead. And I said, and I said, yeah, I guess you are. And then I went to the newer part of town, and the newer part of town had three quarters of the vote. And the newer people all voted for these young new people. Yeah. So we endorsed them and we got elected. Mm -hmm. And it was very good for the newspaper, because okay. everybody noticed. Yeah. Um, was Everybody knows, noticed that you endorsed them and they won. Right. So uh, it, it helped us in advertising tremendously. I bet it did. I, bet yeah. it. Was, I was going to ask, you know, I mean, you know, newspapers obviously, you know, I, I know that the industry's changed quite a bit. Um, yeah, sure. But, uh, you know, after, during the war and after the war, um, you know, the newspapers and people's awareness of the current events and, you know, the, of course yeah. the war had just ended, it, so much had changed and was in the process of, of developing yeah. after the war um what was you know what was the environment at the time were people talking about the war constantly were they um you know of course they must there must have been soldiers that you know had yeah. been injured or been killed yeah. um, or those who, who luckily maybe didn't see combat and yeah. were able to make it home um you know everyone had been affected uh, right. from the war so yeah. what, what were people talking about at the time um you know, um, and, you know, around the time that, that you got yeah. out of the service, yeah. the time when you started, you know, we're leaning towards starting the paper. Yeah. That's a good question. I, I kind of, quite honestly, I would be fibbing if I told you I knew. I, we were all trying to get back to civilian life. Um, and, you know, there were some people, friends of ours, friends of ours who were killed. I played basketball in our high school team. We had 10 fellows on the team. Two of them were killed. And it was quite common. I went to service with uh, a friend of mine and, uh, in, at Camp Grant. And they drew a line between his name and my name, gave us a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And everybody from 5 to 10 went to, to Texas, and everybody from 1 to 5 went to Pennsylvania. I went to Pennsylvania, he went to Texas. Eight months later, he was killed. Oh, no. Now that's, that's the way it was. Yeah. When I went overseas, uh, I was told, I don't know how true it was, one of the guys that second day we were out, he was killed. So, um, well, that's not helping you much. Well, no, 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 it is. I mean, it's, are you going to be here for a while? Well, I, I am. I mean, did, did you want to... Uh, well, oh, you know what? I have to put something on the mail. Okay. okay and I've got to get it in the mail by 6 o'clock. That's fine. That's fine. Um, can I help you uh, well, an, we, another time? Well, um, if you'd like to, we can... Um, I can talk to Neil about uh, maybe uh, scheduling a, a you know, follow-up interview or something oh, like that. That would be, be good. comfortable with that. And I just found out about it today, and I've got something on oh, no, it. It's okay. got to be in the mail by, this, by tonight. What's the date today? It's, uh, it's the 14th. It's about... It has to be in the mail by the, by the 15th. Okay. So I've got to get it in. Okay. Well, let me, if you don't mind, let me, let me yeah. close this. Let me stop this. And okay. then, uh, thank you very much for the interview, by the way. Oh, thank, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Julia. Thank you. You are very good at what you do. Thank you. I, thank you. I'd, I'd love to ask you more questions too, if possible. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to stop it there, and then what I'll do is I'll stop this right here. Yeah. Um, there. And the American Legion is being run by a lot of wealthy real estate people. Okay. And uh, and I did like the idea that they were making making money by having people join the American Legion with them. Yeah. And then they would tell them what real estate people would go to. I see. So I never joined any, any veterans administration. And there was one that was very good. And I never joined it and I was a little sorry I never did. Which one was that? I can't remember. American something or other. Um, did you... Um... 
But I got to get you know, Yeah, 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 that's fine. That's because the post office closes at six, Absolutely. and I've got to get two letters in there. Okay, no problem. Um,